Let me introduce myself briefly. I am Hiro Akiyasutake, so please call me Hiro. I am a director of the Japan CTO Association, and I used to be the CTO of Rakuten until 2016 January. And now I am running a small startup called Junify in the United States. And also an advisor of the several Japanese companies、uh, from small to enterprise. And I am watching many challenges and how to utilize and manage technologies in the organization. So I'd like to discuss with you about this topic. And about you. Yes, I introduced、um, myself for a shit year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't think I need to ask you to introduce yourself in very detail because they found many, many information about you because thanks to the, your radical transparency policy. So many, many info is,、uh, information is on the internet. But I think it would be very helpful for the audience、uh, to ask you to introduce yourself briefly and also as、uh, topics、uh, which you are paying attention recently. Certainly. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, open government, and youth engagement. I will read you my job description, which I wrote in 2016 as a prayer、uh, to highlight the topics that I care deeply about. It's very short, it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. I checked your GitHub account today and I saw that you are still writing a code and uploading it to the GitHub. It's very, very interesting. I've never Seen or heard that the Japanese politician is actively writing a code now. So,、mm -hmm. what kind of the project are you working on? What, what kind of the、uh, project do you have interest in right、like、now? I believe in automating away the chores. This is the virtue of laziness, right? That I learned from Larry Waugh when I was a very young Perl hacker. And so I tend to just look at my workflow,、uh, identify the part of workflow that could be automated. And I talk to myself saying, you know, even if it's just five minutes, well, I write code pretty quickly. So it takes me maybe 10 minutes to automate away a five minute task. So by the second time I do this, I Already save time. So, if you see my commits recently, it will be about maintaining my radical transparency records. I'm、uh, currently integrating、uh, many different input forms, including this conversation,、uh, in a、uh, semi automated way so that everything can be captured in a way、uh, that could be mind mapped and shared later. Wow. Which computing language you were using and what is most favorite one? Part. The thing is,、uh, I dream in Perl, so、uh, <laughs> I can write Perl、uh, without thinking. So, for very quick scripting tasks, of course, I still write Perl. But, of course, to share code with other people,、um, nowadays the lingua franca,、uh, JavaScript, of course, is what I go to nowadays. I'm an avid reader of code. So, although I'm not a professional, for example, Rust programmer、uh, or Python programmer or Ruby programmer, I can read、uh, such. A code without much difficulty. Yeah, I also a big fan of the PAR, and the, when I used to work for the Lactin, I wrote a lot of the PAR code for the backend kind of the batch systems. But it was a bit problem for the other people because my PAR code was not good. Well, it, it creates、uh, an incentive for our staff to replace the code、uh, that we wrote. So, in a sense, it's specification delivered、uh, as prototypical code. I want to start the first topic about the big changes we are watching right now. The core theme of this event is change. So, I'd like to open the conversation、uh, from this keyword. As a phrase, change、uh, brings people kind of a mix of feelings. It sounds positive if people believe the bright future after the change, but the people get very nervous if they want to stay as they are. So, whether people like it or not, technology has been evolving and will be evolving from now on, and it has created a lot of changes of the society. So, I see many hope and fear at the same time among the people, especially about the technology. 
So I'd like to start from asking you uh, changes and key technologies behind the change that you've seen and you have interested in this kind of past five or 10 years. Definitely. Um, so I believe technology and technologists like us should change to adapt to an evolving societal demand. So uh, it's about appropriate technology, meaning that technology that could be appropriated by people on the ground. That is in contrast to disruptive technology, which means the technologies don't change and we expect people to adapt themselves uh, to the disruptive technology because they got disrupted, right? So it's two very different view uh, on change making. And I'm firmly on the camp uh, of pluralist, meaning that whatever change the technology makes is to adapt to the societal needs without harming existing societal norms. Now, uh, to further this kind of co-creation in the past decade, one of the most important technologies that we have seen is real-time collaborative tools. Indeed, we are using one right now, right? Otherwise, we will have to physically travel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that previously, people have to be in the same room sharing a whiteboard, uh, maybe listening to each other. But as each individual person comes to the room, it gets progressively harder and harder for them to catch up on the context and build meaningful relationships. Once it hits Dunbar's number, 150 people, then the organization become hierarchical. It became impossible to be flat or to peer to peer. But in the past 10 years, time and again, we have seen community innovations in distributed ledger communities, in the open source, open innovation communities. We've seen crowdsourcing and crowdfunding building upon the asynchronous Wikipedia model into the more synchronous model. Indeed, we have seen that people can co-create with not just 150 people, but tens of thousands of people at the same time through collaborative tools. So I believe modern day co-creation collaborative tools is the most important societal innovation in the past decade. And indeed, that's how Taiwan <laughs> countered the pandemic without a single day of lockdown and countered the disinformation crisis with no takedowns from the administration. I read a lot of the news about your amazing achievement. It was actually amazing. <laughs> and thank you for sharing your abuse. It's the, the keyword uh, co-creation and collaboration. I think it's very, very important. And so this uh, the conversation won't be happen if we don't have any technologies. Uh, thank you for the online collaboration tools now so we can talk and we can share the information simultaneously to the many, many people. But at the same time, I was wondering this might have a kind of both of the positive and negative side, especially the social media has a huge, huge kind of impact, uh, making an impact on the society. So how do you see the big impact of the social media right now? When it becomes easy to connect with many, many people at the same time, what we have discovered is that the societal norms around gatherings differ from one social media place to the other. I've often liked Facebook as a nightclub uh, in the digital realm, in the entertainment sector. People go there to be entertained. Uh, but because its business model is selling you, well, not addictive drinks, but addictive advertisement, but uh, something is very similar, right? So they want, at least initially, to get people into a mood of impulse, impulsive buying, impulsive sharing, and things like that. And the emotion outrage uh, is very viral, meaning that it motivates uh, more clicking of the button share without thinking twice about it. So it's like like saying, you know, when we try to hold a civilized conversation, maybe with our mayor, maybe a town hall, but when we hold it 
in the nightlife district in a nightclub, we found this very difficult because smoke filled the room. You can't see each other very well. Um, you have to shout to get heard. Uh, there's private bouncers. Uh, there's addictive drinks, as I mentioned. Uh, all in all, maybe some gambling going on. So all in all, very difficult to sustain a civilized conversation. But social media is not just that sort of nightlife district. There's also the digital equivalent of university campuses. Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, um, is a student pet project from a university subsidized entirely by the academic network for the past 25 years. So people concentrated on the common good, on getting the message out that pertains to the common good without uh, wasting their time because there's no advertisers at all uh, or any profit-seeking motives. So that's civic infrastructure. In Taiwan, we also have the digital public infrastructure like the JOIN platform where people can participate in budget making and reviewing, in starting petitions, in meeting in a local town hall, literally, about their allocation of budget or regulatory pre-announcements and so on. And again, the three million different uh, visitors in more than 30 million visits in a year, they enjoy themselves because they know that there will be no room for trolls and the joint platform is not trying to push any advertisement or any commercial uh, addiction to them. So while the underlying technology may be similar, recommendation engines and so on, it's designed around different societal norms. And just for the record, I'm not against the entertainment sector. I just want to say that the city should be, there's some public parks, some campuses, some town halls, uh, which is also important. We can't only have societal gatherings in the nightlife district. Yeah, thank you for pointing and both of the positive and the negative side. And we're going to talk about the positive side later, but so the, I want to ask you a little bit more about the negative side. So the, you uh, said that kind of the keyword is nightclub and addiction, those kind of things. As uh, kind of the government or the kind of the, the position of the kind of sh kind of the platformers or the tech giants, I'm not sure what is the right word. Should they control the information or the do you believe the kind of the perfect freedom will be the future among the kind of the, on the social media network? So I see this as a mental health issue, and of course, just like we protect against the negative externalities on, say, smoking or drinking of hard liquor in nightlife district. So too, should we emphasize on the digital competence education, not just in basic education as Taiwan does, but also in lifelong education. Because if uh, a child is exposed to addictive drinks and smoking uh, as the socially cool thing to do before they can form their own opinions about such substances, then of course the society pays a very large externality negatively about this situation. And so if we phrase it as a mental health thing, one of the most important thing is to understand, I think is a rat part experiment that showed us that addiction is a symptom, but it's not a cause, it's not a root cause. It is mostly societal disconnection, uh, loneliness, the feeling of disempowerment, and many other things uh, that cause the addictive behavior. So if today it's not social media, if you banned uh, social media, something else that may be worse uh, will get people addicted if they feel disempowered and disconnected to their communities. So I believe two things. First, that we should foster the civil society organizations such as PTT to build compelling alternatives of social gathering places for people to build meaningful connections that can actually affect in policy change. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we should be as transparent as possible in our own behaviors on the digital realm from the government and ask the private sector to do the same. When we do campaign donation and financing, for example, we publish as open data in Taiwan so that journalists can analyze all the different connections of election campaigns uh, and the lobbyists, for example. But if the lobbyists turn around and buy some sponsored advertisements on Facebook and bypass the entire societal norm around transparency, then of course it creates a very bad rippling effect. 
which is why the Taiwanese people in 2019 threatened social sanctioning uh, Facebook if they do not conform to the radical transparency standards that the government is already doing around uh, campaign donation. And so Facebook um, basically said, okay, uh, we will do that in your jurisdiction. And for all the social and political advertisement, they also disclose as open data so that uh, such influences do not bypass the societal and journalistic oversight. So just like public health experts is the most important uh, profession encountering the pandemic, I firmly believe journalism and civic journalists is the most important profession when fighting against this mental health hazard. Thank you. So now I got your point. So now people tend to see a kind of new social network as kind of the evil technology. So tend to focus on the technology because it's new. But as you mentioned, the social media, even though if it's very, very addictive, it might be similar with the smoking or the alcohol, just alcohol. So we have to take some control on kind of the human behavior side. But the technology helps. But uh, people tend to see the technology is itself as a kind of the evil or the bad things. But that is different. That is just the activity of the people. That's your point, right? And to extend uh, the metaphor a little bit, of course, uh, we have seen jurisdictions uh, such as the U.S. at one point uh, did the prohibition, which means outlawing alcohol drinking like uh, completely, right? Yeah. But prohibition uh, is now generally seen as kind of a very drastic last resort. It is a little bit like locking down everyone when the pandemic gets really bad. It may be necessary or perceived as necessary, but prevention and public health education is the most important because lockdowns have its consequences and people uh, suffer fatigue and maybe people make a habit of breaking the law if you lock them down too too long right uh, and so while of course some conversations around the kind of sanctions uh, that mm. we impose on the more anti-social corner of social media maybe like hard drugs uh, that's worth having a conversation however if we classify all social media as bad and ban them all uh, that will has its own uh, negative externalities because the civil society groups will not then have the time and the uh, expertise uh, to build uh, what i call vaccines of the mind uh, the kind of good habits like washing your hands and wearing masks uh, that can actually help defend against further mutations of the virus of the mind. Thank you so much. I want to move on to the second topic. Second topic is about how to manage the technologies in the organization. As we discussed, the technology makes a huge impact on a society like a social media. So the technology is a very important tool for everyone right now. But I see some difficulties to manage uh, te technologies, especially in a traditional organization like a government. The agility is the another key, important keyword to provide the good services for citizens or the customers. And it is very, very famous story that Taiwan made a great success to kind of distribute the masks to the people uh, by making the clear stock of the masks in each pharmacy when the COVID-19 started. It was amazing, amazing kind of the quick and strong actions. And I had the, your story, so the, when you visit the pharmacy and the pharmacy owner was struggled uh, because the all must all sold out, but it's still uh, available sign on the, the web. And you ordered or they asked someone to change it and it was fixed very quickly. That's great agility and it is totally different from kind of the stereotype of the government services and the public sector services. So I want to ask you, did you achieve that? And what is the key items to make any of the public services or everything better with the agility? Thank you. I think there are two keys, uh, swift and safe. So when I was a child, I visited Germany, stayed there uh, for a year. And I remember that my mother uh, drove um, on Autobahn, uh, the German uh, 
like highway, and、uh, it's very famous because it has no speed limits. And that was news to me because in Taiwan we always have speed limits、uh, in our highways. But my mother explained to me that the Germans they think if you design the road right, if you design your cars right. If people have the right expectations going to into the driveway, then actually the faster you are, the safer you become, and this is a very counterintuitive thing for me. So I remember it very clearly. But agility is about actually reducing risk as you move quicker, because we can actually pay off technical debts much more easy. If we see the discrepancies, the data biases, and so on earlier in the game, if we have a on-site customer pointing out the difficulty that our design、uh, will cause, then we can actually adjust it very quickly, as opposed to like waiting to read the newspapers, which may be a week、uh, later into the game, right? So faster is actually also safer, and the key to co-creation within a bureaucracy. Is to make sure that we publish as soon as we collect data. Of course, privacy and trade secret and many other things need to be respected. But for example, the mask inventory has no privacy impact; it's zero privacy impact. And so, because of that, if we publish every 30 seconds, it enable everyone to see the data bias. And when they point out the issues, as you mentioned, we can then say, "Yeah, no, there's bias in the data. Please help us correct it because you have the same raw data as we do." But in the higher latency、uh, way, if we publish it every、um, week, then nobody can help. Everybody can just criticize or protest or whatever because they do not have the、uh, operational data, the minute-to-minute data、uh, that can、uh, lead. To new ways of distribution, pre-registration, and things like that. And counterintuitively, if you hold data on your hands for a week before publishing it, and the data was wrong, nevertheless, everybody blames you. But if you do not hold the data and publish soon as it's collected every 30 seconds, well, everybody knows you have no time to review the data anyway. So you do not get the blame. You get、uh, poor requests.、Uh, you get Things、uh, that are very constructive and co-creative, simply because people see that the government is really trusting the citizens. That's amazing story. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. The all data should be disclosed if there is a data. But at the same at the same time, so the, I wanna go into the little bit deeper. But the data requires the system, and system sometimes it's very old-fashioned. Kind of like a hustle system. It's the dinosaur, and it is very hard to maintain, hard to retrieve the data from the database, and there are a bunch of the reasons we cannot do that. And I guess even in Taiwan, the situation might be something like that. There are many similar situations. I, I saw the many similar situations all over the world, especially in a traditional organization. The system is very old-fashioned and it's not capable、uh, for keeping the agility good. So I want to ask you, what is the situation in Taiwan and how you manage? Yeah, I will use one example. In 2020, when we did um, our um, payment stipend, really、uh, to people who are of middle or low income who are adversely affected、uh, by the pandemic. Many of them do not have a smartphone,、uh, or even if they do, they do not want and have no experience of installing additional apps or navigating a progressive、uh, web app. So, because of that,、uh, many people took to the counters、uh, to write. Uh, their bank accounts, or if they don't have a bank account, they want to receive a check. Then they write their、uh, physical address, and they,、uh, of course, have their personal details, some proofs how they were adversely、uh, affected in their incomes by the pandemic, and so on. And it created such a huge uh, backlog uh, that the local municipalities simply could not review. Those applications in time,、uh, the new Taipei City、uh, even 
put boxes and boxes of such forms and shipped it, carried it to the central government, saying, uh, "You have designed uh, this system. Now you help us uh, to digitize it." And it took very long time uh, before we can actually process all those forms. Uh, and I see you nodding, and so maybe Japan is no stranger <laughs> to that sort of、uh, situation. But in 2021, we are prepared. So in 2021, when we run exactly the same project again, we simply said there is no counter. We're not setting up any counter to receive applications.、Uh, there will、um, be no way、uh, to submit things、uh, through those counter. Now, of course, maybe you're thinking: Are we forcing people to use smartphones? We're not.、Uh, what we're doing is that、uh, we're printing out those forms in a、uh, simplified way. Kind of like a postcard, a large、uh, A4 paper that you can fold twice into an envelope with the postage、uh, already paid,、uh, and people can print it themselves. The PDF is available online. The local community offices and so on can just photocopy as many forms as possible. So we switched from a centralized、um, kind of hub and spoke model. Into a plural model where everyone can serve as distributor of those forms, and once they fill in the forms,、uh, which is simplified and have a photocopy、uh, of the envelope of their bank account, for example, they just push it into a local post box, and then the post people、uh, will deliver it into the social entrepreneurs、uh, that specialize in working with people who may be handicapped; they can't move、uh, very easily, but they still type.、Uh, Very well, professionals. So to find them、uh, the job of digitizing very quickly all the incoming postcards. So the people who can use website, of course, use the website. But even for people who prefer to send a postcard, their requests become website requests very quickly, thanks to the very efficient、uh, mail delivery and、uh, the typing people. And so by introducing. Assistive intelligence, meaning instead of asking people to change their habits, we assist all the public servants along the way to reduce their burden and risk.、Um, we very quickly reimburse,、uh, pay the stipend、uh, to everyone who ha- are eligible、uh, to such payments. So、uh, the point I'm making is that, of course, it is very difficult to change a technological stack, but it is very easy. Actually, to introduce some plugins, to introduce some assistive、uh, tools that do not replace anyone on the processing line, but rather reconfigure the processing line so it becomes massively parallel. And that is mostly the work we're doing in digital transformation here. That is a great idea. So the replacing the kind of central database or the system architecture is always hard. So you don't focus on the scrap and build from the everything, rather. So you focus on you set plugin, and yes, kind of the assistive technology and attaching to the many plugins to the kind of the old-fashioned the technologies. Yes, that's how the internet was built. Right, the DNS,、uh, the email, and so on, were all built on such principles of polycentralism. Wow, that's great idea. Yeah, I, I I have the same idea, but sometimes there's no API of the central system, and it's very hard to connect with the old-fashioned the system sometimes. So, do you see some difficulties in Taiwan too?、Uh, in 2016, we changed our procurement contract template. Previously, if you build a people-facing、uh, system or website, and you say it's only for people who can see,、uh, but for people who cannot see very well,、uh, well, they're doomed. If you say that as a IT vendor,、uh, you may be disqualified. From government purchases,、mm-hmm. accessibility is very important, and everything needs to adapt to screen readers and many assistive tools、uh, that the people with different abilities use. So we piggybacked on that existing clause in a template and say machines are a kind of people needing accessibility、uh, help. So JSON Open API is a kind of screen reader,、uh, and if any IT vendor build a system and say, "Oh, this is good only for human beings," but if you start to speak Open API standard, then、uh, we cannot provide service. 
they can also be disqualified for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's the effect. So basically, by putting an API first way of designing things, this solves the dilemma of wanting the stability of the bedrock of the systems, which may be running, um, I don't know, DB2, uh, hopefully not DBase3, uh, but a very old uh, technology, but uh, they need to speak JSON. They need to speak Open API standard. We made the OAS3 a national standard even before OAS3 gets released. So even when it's released candidate, we already made it a national standard. So when we uh, fight the pandemic, we're then blessed with a lot of Lego blocks that may be repurposed very quickly. Uh, the Lego blocks of authentication of mobile IT pairs very well with the Lego block of printing the QR code for uh, contact tracing, the SMS-based contact tracing. Uh, the system that we use to file our personal tax uh, can be repurposed in just three days into uh, rationing out uh, the mask uh, pre-registration. And that system, after changing for another couple of months, become vaccine reservation system, plugging into many other APIs as well. So when you have a API first uh, procurement contract, the IT vendors learn that they can work with startups and keep their job security because the startups specialize on the front end innovation and they can still maintain their bedrock code bases. Wow, it's it's beautiful story. That's great. And I totally agree with the direction, but in most of organizations, especially in a public sector, for me, it looks very, very difficult or the most, it's almost impossible because the owner vendor controls everything. And the, the organization side, there is no person who are familiar with the tech to change the programming process or send the require, clear requirement to the vendors. I see some kind of the structure problem in a kind of the traditional organization. Taiwan is totally different. It's amazing. Yeah. And so what about outsourcing and in-house development team in a government sector? So do you have in-house tech team inside of the organization or the outsourcing everything to the IT vendors? The designers are in-house. Uh, the coders are often uh, contracted, but there um, is, of course, a tendency of designers who can also code. Um, well, I'm a designer who uh, code as a way to express my design, right? So it creates uh, a pressure on the IT vendor because if they do not meet the deadline, for example, uh, personally, I go in and write some code uh, to to uh, fill in that particular part that didn't fill the, the deadline. Uh, and of course, uh, this code is not meant to be maintained. Uh, so the code quality is not properly reviewed and so on, uh, but, but at least it conveys the design concept across. So designers who can code, not uh, especially well and not in a maintainable way, but they can code to express their ideas. That is very, very important. And then the IT vendors are then uh, left with no choice because the minister's code uh, must be scrapped in order to be maintained. So they have to rewrite that part of code, but the API is already there. So they have to conform to my design, <laughs> right? So um, a designer who cannot code of course, face pushback from the IT, from the ops, and so on. But a digital designer who can code always have the upper hand. I learned that from my time in Apple, by the way. Uh, I've never had a minister step in the project and writing a code to push them forward. That's an amazing story. Well, thank you. Yes, now, technology can make a big change of the traditional indirect democracy system. I totally agree with that. But at the same time, everyone knows that technology can make a big change, but it is also not easy to change the traditional the system at the same time because the people don't believe the power of the technology or the people are not familiar with the technology enough. So there is a huge gap between the technology can do and the people exactly do that or not. 
So what's your idea to fill the gap of the technology can do and people want to do? I think democracy itself is a social technology. Um, when we say democracy, we actually refer <clears throat> to many specific forms of social collaboration. Uh, maybe you're thinking about voting for mayors and voting for presidents. Uh, maybe I'm thinking about participatory budgeting. Uh, some other people may think about referendums, uh, yet others may think of petitions and so on. And all these are democracy. They are forms of democracy. Uh, there's people working on new uh, technologies in the democratic space, for example, citizens' assembly, which like a jury, but not for court cases, uh, but for administrative cases. There are people who experiment with sortition, uh, random generated panels of people who deliberate and bring things back to their communities and many, many others. So when we say democracy, I think it's important to understand that it means a tendency of technologists to work on things that enable people to make decisions together. And as long as a technology can enable make decisions together in a way that is more accepted than the technologies before, then they're contributing to democracy. I would say also that it has no um, direct link to digital. Digital is assistive, meaning we can help uh, speed up or reach more people uh, in those democratic innovations. But some of the most innovative democratic innovations, such as uh, open space technology, uh, although it says technology, uh, it's really just about uh, a food camp or bar camp or a unconference uh, where people walk from one room or another corner of the room and set agenda together uh, and maybe use some thoughts for voting and so on. And none of this is digital. I mean, uh, I can't think of digital ways to make it easier, but it's not inherently digital. So I think we need to make the distinction that IT's potential is large. It connects machine to machines. But when we say digital, it means connecting people with people. And that's a different class of technology. It's social, plural technologies. Uh, and that technology is still yet to be invested fully by people because previously investments into the space um, suffer from the tragedy of the commons. Almost by nature, it has to be open source, free software. Uh, so you cannot directly derive monopolistic profit from investment into such spaces. But nowadays, of course, we're seeing governments as well as venture capitalists are seeing, oh, this is actually something like the early ARPANET. It's not just for uh, military or the academia. It's also useful for ordinary people uh, to run their communities together. And so something like a prototypical internet is now forming around such social technologies to make decisions uh, together. So Taiwan is one of the early labs, I think, in this collaboration, but it's not about particular IT technologies. It's about particular forms of democracy that we can improve together. I see. So the, you intentionally use the uh, kind of the digital as a phrase to connect people, human beings, yes. and technology mm -hmm. is to connect machines. It is different. Yes. Wow, mm -hmm. that's a very new concept for me. In English, digitization connects machines, but digitalization connects people uh, with an awe in it. So that's a difference from the Internet of Things and Internet of Beings. Thank you so much. That's very inspiring. And so in your kind of team, is that the executive team in a Taiwan, Taiwanese government. So how much people understand that kind of latest technology trend and the essential of the technologies? Well, as we know, the best way to predict the trend of technology is to create it yourselves. So we believe uh, in lowering the cost of experimenting with new forms of technologies. For example, when people care about the air pollution PM 2.5, 
instead of waiting for the government to expand on the network of PM2.5 sensing stations, which in 2014, there was less than 100, people just built their own uh, based on Arduino, on Raspberry Pi, on many other uh, open hardware designs and very simple sensors that individually may be inaccurate. But when tens of thousands of people participate together, it paints a very accurate picture of PM2.5 and other air pollution metrics. And so this is what I call a people-public-private partnership, meaning that it starts with the social sector, with people experimenting, uh, mm -hmm. the maker community experimenting with new ways of sensing the weather and pollutions together. And once they gather the data, they gain legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the government, because when uh, students, parents, want to decide whether they want to run jog uh, in the morning, they of course trust their own balcony or their child's school instead of many kilometers away at the governmental weather station on the air pollution metrics. And once they gain legitimacy, they then gain political capital. And the government, because we're a liberal democracy after all, we say, yeah, we can't beat them. We must join them. So then we take the specification as created by the society and ask the hard to reach places such as industrial parks, because we own the lamps there, uh, to adopt exactly the same PM2.5 air boxes as the design of the community. And of course, we also help on lowering the cost uh, calibrating the precision, hardening against cybersecurity attacks, and so on. That's what the government can contribute. And then the private sector, far from capturing the regulation or far from monopolizing the manufacturing, they can then build a impact economy based on um, the amelioration of those pollutions uh, based on measuring accurately the pollutants and then sell green and upcycling and circular economy industry instead of uh, selling toolkits to evade uh, the mm -hmm. governmental inspection right so uh, in a more pro-social way we build the economy for the better starting from the social sector norms so we emphasize the importance of accessibility and the importance of co-creation, especially in the basic education. In the next topic, I want to focus on more the people mindset, especially about the new technologies. Let me give you the one example. In, in Japan, we still see kind of many digitized information posted on the government website with PDF format. And it's really hard for the machines to read and it is not familiar with the the human beings because the it says very complicated Japanese phrases, it's old fashioned Japanese phrases. In, for the most of people, it is really hard to understand. It's just long PDF format. In 2020, now 2022, in the internet era, I don't think it makes sense for the most of people. And I think the root cause of the issue comes from the people mindset in the organization. The announcement from the government have done on the paper for a long time. And it is what people are familiar with. And there are some rules and regulations. So it is really hard to break and change the rules or the mindset. And we are behind against the speed of the evolving technologies. We can provide better services with latest technologies, but mindset is still far behind. And I see the gap yet. So do you see similar gap in Taiwan too? Well, I'm not against PDF. When, when you get uh, a vaccine shot uh, in Taiwan, of course, the entire record is kept uh, in the NIIS, uh, the NICE system, which is entirely structured. You can very easily download it uh, with the personal uh, app of the National Health Insurance Administration's uh, NHI Express app and so on. But at the end of the day, if you want to travel abroad, and you go to uh, DVC for a digital vaccination certificate, dvc.mohw, the gov, the tw, uh, authenticate using FIDO or using your national health card number, uh, and then click uh, make a certificate. That's still a PDF. Uh, so we're not uh, against PDF because it looks very pretty. It, it looks official. Uh, it, it has this mark, this seal, this air of officialness, legitimacy on it. 
But of course, uh, equally important is that uh, prominent in that PDF is a QR code corresponding to the EU DCC so that you can uh, actually cut down everything else and just keep that QR code. Uh, it carries the same legitimacy anyway. We make sure that our verifier uh, is a, a progressive web application, so you don't have to download it. It's agnostic on your web browser and so on. It's open source, MIT licensed. So you can actually fork uh, our uh, vaccine credential checker uh, and to integrate it uh, with your own workflow and so on. Uh, and of course, there's already uh, integrations of the Google Pay and Apple Pay wallets uh, and many more. So while the form looks like the PDF, just to make people feel safer so that they can print it as a fallback, if they don't have a phone, if their phone runs out of battery, at least they can take out that printed PDF and show the same QR code and they feel much safer for it. Uh, but it does not exclude newer applications based on those QR codes. So I say, why not have both? Right. Let's have the PDF, but have the PDF carrying structural data with uh, electronic signature verified on open source technologies. And so people can bring whatever workflow they want into it. Thank you. The, the, the PDF carrying the structural data and the digital signature is totally different from what I told you. And so the, last week I had to go to the San Francisco to get the resident certification and I downloaded the PDF, but I can wrote down the, my uh, personal information on the digitized PDF, but it was just for printing out. So it's a PDF, but just digitized copy of the old fashioned paper format. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we call it PDF 1.0 uh, and yeah. the PDF I'm talking about PDF 3.0 or something. <laughs> yep. So the latest technology will help to kind of reduce the cost of the operation and provide a better service, a user experience to the customers. But people's mindset still stays on all the fashions. I'm not sure, but I mm -hmm. still don't find a good way uh, to break this mm -hmm. loop of the chain. It's not easy mm -hmm. to change. The yeah, mindset. yeah I, I never break people's mindset. I always do incremental um, contributions. Mm -hmm. So it's about harmless coexistence. The people who are used to paper would not mind if the paper suddenly have some QR code on it. I mean, they just skip that, right? But for us, of course, the QR code is the only important thing in that paper. So by piggybacking on existing vehicles, we make sure that people feel comfortable. And that's the most important thing. When we rationing out the mask on convenience stores, my grandma said that my plan, initial plan of using ATM uh, and a debit card is a bad plan. Uh, she's almost 90 years old now, and her young friends, uh, 77 years old, uh, feel that the ATM is a dangerous place. They only use ATM to withdraw cash, but they never use ATM to wire money. They always go to the post office or the bank and write on a piece of paper because they were afraid if they type just one digit wrong, their entire saving will be gone. So when we initially designed the mask rationing, pre-registration and ordering to be on the ATM machine and um, just wiring uh, a few dollars uh, to get a receipt and you can redeem that for mask the next week, uh, they said they will never use it. They will rather go back to pharmacy to queue in line. And that's when we change the kiosks, the, the um, workload, so that they can use the exactly the same uh, national health card, no password required uh, and no money uh, wired. Uh, in the kiosk. So they just insert their national health card and get a receipt and they can pay in cash, uh, counting the coins uh, on the counter in the convenience store. And then they're happy uh, to go to the convenience store for mask uh, pre-registration in 2020, that was April. So the point is that it may seem less effective. It's probably less efficient, but it's actually better because then the people who have co-created together the 77 year old uh, Grandma Young, <clears throat> she's a community key opinion leader. So she will then teach the 66 years old and 55 years old and so on and rally everyone 
into this new way because she participated in the co-creation and she is happy and she doesn't feel that her expectation of the ATM is broken and so on. So I think uh, social innovation begins uh, by empowering people closest to the pain, regardless of what we think as effective or efficient. Thank you. So the, my mistake was the, I was trying to make a kind of the big jump instead of that, the incremental approach, incremental improvement, step by step, it's a good way to navigate the people for the new technologies. That's, thank yes. you so much for your advice. Mm. That's a great, great story. <laughs> you established, started a company as an entrepreneur. And now you are leading the country. That's amazing career for us. Could you share your view about the career and advices for the audiences? I think I'm just a person uh, who can code. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I code as a way to express my design ideas and brief and sketches and so on. And I think identifying with particular experiences is fine. I said I started programming when I was eight. That was fine. But I would not say when I was eight, I become a programmer. Uh, I would not say that. Because defining oneself in one's profession uh, may be great uh, career-wise, but when new situation comes and you're uh, basically forced <laughs> to adapt uh, your line of work because you want to adapt to the actual societal needs, then you will then have to take different sides. You will have to take the sides that you were less familiar with. Uh, you may actually have to understand the MBA's language <laughs> or the designer's language or the um, quality assurance, customer success, many other languages. But it's important to see them as uh, as what they, they are like languages. It's just running like uh, the laws and regulations running on a different virtual machine. So keep your computational thinking mindset, keep your design thinking mindset, but do not define yourself into being too tightly coupled to particular mm -hmm. instruction sets. Uh, and once you become uh, portable, I think that's the word, you become portable in your experiences, you will find that far more than we imagined, whatever we learned in the software engineering profession, uh, the key about refactoring, about forking, about merging and things like that, about collaboration, it can actually port very well into politics, into commerce, into many other areas. So keep agile and keep portable. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are using the CTO as a kind of the key phrase of our community. But as you are the advice, so we can put our the technology knowledge at the center of our skill, but we have to open up our eyes to the outside of the, sh the sh technologies and to connect the people and the world. Yeah, thank you for a great advice. A final remark, could you give us some key message about the how to adapt the changes or the how to make impact on the teams, organizational society? I would like to invite you to think of ourselves as good enough ancestors. Most of the work that are going to be done are going to be done by next generations. If we are humble enough, we must be good enough instead of perfect because we can actually not be perfect. And even if we are, it leaves less room for the next generation to innovate. So to quote my favorite poet, Lena Cohen, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. For there is a crack, a crack in everything. And that is how the light gets in. Thank you for listening. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we really appreciate you to take your precious time for us. And thank you so much till today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.